Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to episode two of the Peak Talk podcast. Today, I've got Dylan Johnson, east coast of the USA. He's a professional gravel racer, but before that, he was a degree educated sports scientist, I think, a cycling coach. And he's pretty much the go-to when it comes to reading out or disseminating white papers about sports science or sporting performance when it comes to cycling. The only white paper he probably hasn't read through is Einstein's theory of relativity. He has proven time travel to be a thing because he's now making a career out of riding mountain bikes from the 1990s. So Dylan, you can take over now. Tell us about your pro racing part, about the Lifetime Grand Prix, which I quote you for saying is the biggest thing in cycling right now, or maybe just in North America. Lifetime Grand Prix, only an American could come up with that name. It sounds lusty, promising, but also slightly threatening at the same time. Mm-hmm. Over here, we'd probably just call it the Gravel National Series or something really lame like that. So over to you, Dylan. Tell us about what you're currently up to. Yeah, well, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, the the go-to for white papers is is quite a... a quite... Quite the statement about me. I appreciate that. Um, as far as the Lifetime Grand Prix goes, I hope I didn't say it was the biggest thing in cycling because that sounds a bit egotistical considering that I'm in the series. Uh, I would. S- I-, I hope this doesn't come off as egotistical. There's probably some roadies who are going to get mad at me for saying this, but I think that it's the biggest thing in cycling in the U.S. right now. I think it's in the cycling world in the U.S., and maybe I'm biased because I am in the series and I am a gravel racer, and that's kind of what I follow. But I think in the U.S. in cycling right now, uh, that is the most popular pro racing that's going on. Okay, can you tell me a bit more about what the Lifetime Grand Prix is? Because from my point of view, maybe the the kind of social media outreach doesn't reach over here so much because our, our gravel in, I think, Europe and specifically the UK is still kind of just a fun niche. It's a, yeah. it's a bit of a quirky niche. It's not so commercialized and not such a high stakes platform like it is over there. Can you dive into a bit more of what is the Lifetime Grand Prix? Um, now, don't spend too long on it because my viewers are really tech heads and we want to get into the techie stuff in a <laughs> sure. minute. So people call it a gravel series, but it I would call it an off-road series because it does include mountain bike racing. Um, some of the mountain bike races in the series, it's up for debate whether they're actually mountain bike races or not. Uh, they're... They're not very technical, and they have gotten pushback from some riders for including very tame, at least technically, mountain bike races. But I would I would call it an off-road series because there are certainly races in the series that you need a mountain bike for. Um, and, and then, of course, there are plenty of races in the series that you need a gravel bike for. There's seven races total in the series. Um, they're, they're all across the U.S., Although, strangely enough, there are none here where I am on the East Coast. So there's a little bit of bias, a West Coast bias there or something. I don't know. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just like any other pro racing series. You get points during for the races that you do. And uh, I think they take the best of five, five out of seven races. And, and they tally them up. And, and then there's a ranking at the end of the year. I think the one thing that probably sets it up Apart from most series that are similar to it is that it's an exclusive series so you have to apply to get in and then they accept 30 men and 30 women and it's not like any Joe Blow who wants to be a pro can line up on the starting line and and do uh, do the series they can do the races but they won't be part of the series unless they've applied and gotten in well from an outsider's point of view in, in the North America has this series or let's say gravel riding and sort of tame mountain biking has that killed off the road scene or is the road scene still alive and kicking and also what happened to xc racing has this kind of replaced xc is xc dead in in north america yeah so i would say xc racing is just about dead uh wow. just as an example we had a lifetime grand prix race on the same day as our uh xc mountain bike national championships and all the riders went to the Lifetime Grand Prix race instead of going to the XC Mountain Bike National Championships. I don't want to wow. say all. There were some There were some riders that went to the XC Mountain Bike National Championships, but it was clear that the priority was the Lifetime Grand Prix and not our very own national championships for mountain bike XC racing. Um, as far as road racing goes, road racing is, is dying at a slower rate. Uh, I think that there's a chance that... that 
road racing will survive and, and there's still people that follow road racing. Um, it, I, I think gravel is obviously pulling both road racers and mountain bike racers. So it may have fully cu- killed off or basically killed off mountain bike racing. And it's slowly doing that with road racing, but we'll see what actually happens with that road race. There, there's still a decent road scene here in the U S without going too much into the commercial side of it. Why, why do you think, that that killing off is happening is it is it prize money is it sponsorship money is it there's more races or sure uh, it might, does it coincide with just like the boom of social media and it's just easier to like disseminate kind of content related to that um because you know in the road scene it was probably a i guess maybe 10 years ago where you had not the best riders scoring the biggest salaries because of their social media presence and i think that probably started with like sagan because he was such a an mm-hmm. asset for specialized mm-hmm. Um, but that was that was kind of more under the brand's control, whereas now riders are having their own brand and their own Instagram and their own TikTok, God damn it, or whatever. Um, and those <laughs> salaries are actually overtaking their how good they are on a team. Like let, maybe Van der Poel is not going to be the highest paid rider next year because yes, he wins all the races, but actually he's pretty bad at like being on social media. So is it is it because of that, or is it just is it the pure racing that's made it that big? It could certainly be part of that. Um... Gravel racing gets a lot of shit for being a bunch of influencers who are doing it, and maybe that's warranted because, I mean, there are people like me doing it, right? Um, and then there's there's a bunch of other people who maybe they've, they're they big on social media, and they've kind of taken up gravel racing as their main discipline. And uh, I think that to get paid as a gravel pro, at least right now in 2023, 2024, have you you do need a big social media presence um if you're if you're doing well in races that is probably not enough to make a living as a gravel pro but if you're doing well in races and you've got good social media then i think that the reason why gravel is taking off amongst pros is because it is where all the money is um mm. i personally i think that if you are at the domestic pro level in the US and you're trying to decide how to make a career you're gonna make the most money right now if you go to gravel uh if you stick with mountain biking you're not gonna make any money if you stick with road racing you might make a bit from a team but if you can really figure out everything in gravel figure out your social media and be a decent decent enough racer you will make the most money in gravel racing right now in the u.s uh because it certainly isn't like that here i mean we we, i guess we just don't have the amount of gravel roads that you guys have to to explore this niche but it's certainly very, I think, unique in, in terms of North America. I think it's coming, but this brings me on to a topic which we can discuss further in the podcast about where will gravel and road be in, in 10 years, or maybe even less than that. But let's say 2030, will it all converge? But before we go into that, let's, and I, ha- I have to say, um, if, if you're new to the channel, you're maybe Dylan's viewers from North America or gravel heads, welcome. Do click subscribe because I am now in the gravel niche. I have a gravel bike, I'll, I'll have you know. And I'm going to ask Dylan for his thoughts on my gravel setup later in the show. Something that we've spoken about before and something you've spoken about on other podcasts and something I've spoken about with Dan Bigham, obviously performance engineer at Ineos, is, and this is kind of in, in the gravel niche and there's a bit of a crossover with the kind of the off-road side of it and vibration damping and things like this. Let's talk about Paris-Roubaix because I put out a video before about how Paris-Roubaix bikes are basically woefully inadequate they're on completely the wrong type of machine to do well on that kind of terrain now yes the caveat is most of that race is dead flat smooth tarmac so we can't get around that there are super high speeds i think even even with the cobbles last year i think the average speed was 46 or maybe even 45 k's an hour so it's super fast um so aero really is still a thing but um a couple of years ago, I think about two and a half years ago, I did another podcast with Dan Bigham, and, and we both agreed that they were woefully inadequate, basically not optimized. Um, mm-hmm. And the only point of optimization was around the tires. And in, in no other kind of engineering vehicle, where, whether it be motorsport or even kind of civilian transport, would you try and optimize everything just with tire pressure or tire size? But we're trying sure. to do that in, in bike market. Um, You've got ideas about what your ideal bike would look like, and I've got ideas about what mine would look like. So let's start with yours. What do you think the ideal Paris-Roubaix bike should be? So I I find it funny that uh, he said they're optimizing around tires because I don't even think the tires that they're using are optimal for Roubaix. 
I think they should be much wider than they currently are. And every time I say that, the roadies all gasp. You know, I, I throw out a number like they need 45 mil or 40 mil tires, and they all gasp. That's way too wide. I mean, the same thing would have the the same thing would have happened if you told people that the standard Perry Rubé tire was a 32 millimeter. You know, the last time they had Rubé. Uh, if you go back 10 or 15 years, if you told people, oh, uh, the best tire for Roubaix is 32 millimeters, same thing, they would gasp, right? It's just kind of, it's all what people are used to seeing. Uh, and if you jump too far ahead, it's just, it's too much for people to wrap their minds around. You know, if you do too big a jump in tire width, it's just, it, people can't wrap their heads around it being fast. I guess it's probably because I come from gravel racing that I think this, but um, I've done quite a bit of testing myself on gravel, and I keep coming to the conclusion that wider tires are actually faster on gravel, not slower, like so many people seem to still think. And uh, I think it's only a matter of time before, you know, I, I think that that uh, Rube tires are just going to get wider and wider and wider. And I wouldn't be shocked if in 10 or 15 years we are up to 40 millimeters or 45 millimeters. So I guess the way that I'm getting around the suspension question is with the tires. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I thought your video was interesting because you went about it a different way. You didn't necessarily get, get around it with the tires. You were actually wanting to add suspension to the bike. From my point of view, I think the tires could, could get a little bit bigger, but I think the speed's obviously so high. And I think you've done some wind tunnel testing on tire size uh, before about you know how many extra watts you need at certain speed for a 5 mil extra width on the tire or something like that. But if you, from my point of view, in engineering, if you try and optimize, and I've said this so many times in podcasts and stuff, if you try and optimize rolling resistance, grip, uh, vibration and damping, puncture protection just with one component there is going to be so many compromises and by what we're doing at the moment is essentially approaching Roubaix using a slightly bigger tire lowering the pressure we are compromising so many other things like on the flat sections where it's dead smooth asphalt we are compromising so much in CRR which is at, at the speeds of 50 kilometers an hour could be 60 70 watts it's huge I prefer not to just do everything with the tire I prefer to see suspension in the frame. And you might say, oh yeah, we've seen suspension in frames at Roubaix before. They just look stupid. They're elastomer shocks. They don't really work. Mm -hmm. But I think it's been a bit of a hard, like I believe that's a step in the right direction. I just think it's been a bit half-assed because the, the brand doesn't want to put so much R&D money into something they can't market and sell. So if they're not selling those bikes for the masses, there's literally no point. And that's the really, that, you know, cycling is a great sport because you can, you or I can go out and buy uh, Van der Poel's bike that you know he raced Roubaix on, uh, but we can't go and buy uh, Verstappen's F1 car. Um, sure. So yeah, there are good things about having you know basically homologated production race machines. However, they are like completely not optimized for that race. Um, so from my point of view, and I'll I'll try and put something on the screen here in the edit, but I've done a video on this. I'll leave the link in the description. It's a uh, it's got suspension inside the bike, but everything is aerodynamically fed. So the, sh the rear shock is hidden as much as possible. It's got aerofoil, you know, aerofoil profiles to the frame. It's got deep wheel steel, and the tires are not too wide because at 50 k's an hour, the tire width is really, really important. Essentially, when I ride my road bikes, I've got uh, two bikes. One, ri one is rim, um, one is disc brake. Now, it's a, t it's a giant TCR. One has an integrated seat post, uh, so the continuous carbon mast seat post, and that offers basically hardly any flex in the seat post if i ride the other bike which has got the sliding seat post with a clamped interface which allows m way more deflection at the saddle and i've measured it it's basically two and a half times the amount of deflection at the saddle uh, back and down as the isp version i can run the the rim brake bike i can run the the more comfy seat post bike essentially with a much higher tire pressure for the same feel across rough ground so when i get to the smooth sections i'm going faster on that bike um so i believe you should optimize the tire pressure for rolling resistance, i.e. slightly higher pressures, and then put suspension in the frame to mitigate the vibrational losses because a set of you know, cobbles or rutted tarmac, rutted concrete, and if you're, if you're approaching that from a smooth section, you might be going 45 k's an hour. You hit the cobble section, you come off it again, and you're coasting, you might have gone down to 30 k's an hour, and where's that energy gone? You know, you can't destroy that energy. 
you had your kinetic energy at the start, which is that half that half that mass of you times the the velocity squared. You come off the cobbled sections, and now some of that velocity's gone. Your mass hasn't changed, unless your teeth have fallen out. Um, that that energy's gone into shaking all your muscle fibers, heating your body up internally, damped. Your muscle fibers are not elastic. That power, that energy, is essentially been transferred into heat or or losses in your body, which you can't recover. Now, suspension, I believe, would fix that. And you know, you said it on yourself on another podcast. We that sort of legacy GCN stuff, which was really good back in the day. Uh, where they did the the cobble test on mountain bike, a gravel bike, and a road bike, and the mountain bike like wiped the floor. It was so much faster. Yeah. So yeah, if you could take that suspension principle and aerodynamically fare it, so there was hardly any kind of penalty on the flat. I think that's the way to go. But will we ever see these bikes? No, because the steaming irony dump would be that the race would no longer be hard. It would no longer be like hell of the north and all this bullshit. So they had, it's hell of the north because they're on bone rattling, stiff aero bikes. That's why it's hard. You know, if you put everyone on a a perfect bike, it would just be a flat. It'd be like a flat road race. Yeah. You know. But so so that's that's also that's also a question of whether or not they should even pursue this, or whether or not it just makes the race better to watch if everybody is on an inadequate bike, which a lot of people have that argument. Roubaix is Roubaix because you're riding a road bike on roads that road bikes were not made for. Uh, I, I see that argument, but at the same time, one of the things that I like personally about bike racing is when people try to optimize their equipment for whatever terrain they're riding on. Um, people probably already know that about me by watching my videos because that's what I try to do with gravel racing. But if I if I saw Roubaix specific bikes, that would get me super excited to watch the race to see how the bikes performed. But that that's just me personally. Not everybody um, cares about that stuff like I do. I I wanted to ask you about the aerodynamics of your theoretical Roubaix bike because adding suspension to the bike is certainly going to make it less aerodynamic, especially if we're talking about a front fork. I mean, that's that's the first thing hitting the wind. Yeah, that's 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 the worst part about my <laughs> my bike that I'm putting forward. Um, my I guess my ideal kind of suspension would be like an upside down telescopic fork, but instead of having round stanchions, it would have aerofoil stanchions, which, as far as I know, in production is impossible because SKF don't make aerofoil shaped garter seals. They don't make no one's making like composite bushes for the stanchions to slide in. It, those things always have to be round. So that yeah, that's the that's the worst thing aerodynamically about my design. Um, the Scott XC bikes are fully integrated rear shock. You can't even see it. You know, I I think that the the picture you had had a lefty fork. Um, yeah, it I did. That, that was that was uh, <laughs> that was the reason. <laughs> So some of the lefty, at least the lefty forks back in the day, I don't know if they're still doing this, but they had a rock guard on um, a rock guard to to you know prevent the stanchions from hitting rocks. Yeah, you could have an arrow guard. So instead of a yep. rock guard around the stanchion, you could have an airfoiled shape guard. Mm. Uh, I think that's probably a possibility. That's so. I've got a lefty fork, and then at the bottom, I've made the. A kind of plastic guard aerofoil shape oh, you, got, you can't see it because it's on the other side but yeah that's that was my thinking but still not great <laughs> no I, yeah. I i like where your head is at i think where where i was going with the bigger tires is i was thinking what bikes do we currently have available on the market that riders could mm. actually ride and i think that the optimal without creating an entirely new bike that doesn't exist I think the bikes that are currently available on the market would probably be if if you were to take an aero gravel bike, not just the standard gravel bike that's probably s costing a significant aero penalty over a standard road bike, but an aero gravel bike, and you put uh, a really fast pair of 40 or 45 millimeter tires in it, I'm thinking like the Challenge Strata Bianchi tire, um that would probably be the best Roubaix bike that we that you could make out of parts that you could currently buy on the internet at 50 k's an hour let's say do you have any number for what what would be the aerodynamic penalty at 50 k's an hour versus a 32 mil tire or 30 yeah so i think that when we did wind tunnel testing it was uh, a five watt penalty for at 40 oh, man 
I wish I had the numbers right in front of me. I said them on the yeah. last. Po- I said the numbers on the last podcast, and it was because I was getting ready for the video where I was going to talk about my drop bar mountain bike. I think it was. I think it was five watts for five millimeters at four, forty kilometers per hour. So it is. So here's the thing. It is an arrow penalty, um, and this is this is the argument that I made you would have an arrow a slight arrow penalty for almost the entire race but then when yeah. you got to the cobble section you would have a significant rolling resistance advantage and that is usually where the race is won and lost um, because we have the same dilemma in u.s gravel racing there's a lot of u.s gravel races that uh 60 of the race is paved road and then 40 percent is gravel so you have to yeah. decide okay what am i going to do with my bike setup because there's actually a majority pavement in this race and mm-hmm. just like in just like in roubaix the race is won and lost on the hard sections of the course and when there's no yeah. climbing on the course the hard sections of the course are the cobbled sections and True. in u.s yeah. gravel racing the hard sections of the course are the unpaved gravel sections so you kind of have to optimize the bike for those sections. You're already yeah. seeing riders ride a lightweight climbing bike on a flat stage of the tour just so that they can go faster up the final climb. I see it as the same thing. You're picking mm-hmm. an inadequate bike for the majority of the race so that you can win the race when it matters. Very good point. And we must just mention also, I mean, the last couple of editions of, of Roubaix have been absolutely terrible for punctures. Almost like there has yeah, been that's... more punctures lately than... 10 years ago and I don't know if it's just, obviously we're riding harder the, the guys are fitter they're going faster they're hitting the cobbles with more energy however mm-hmm. you could ride a 200 dollar bike from Walmart across all those sectors and probably not puncture like if it was a mountain bike so you mm-hmm. just it's not just about the ultimate speed across the cobbles it's, it's the chance of your race just being wiped out by a puncture maybe mitigated by just having a, a much fatter tire because you can yeah. be the, the strongest guy and have the best tactics and the best plan to attack on the hardest sector. If you've punctured the sector before, it's, it's insane. Like, I mean, I think it was a couple of years ago when Van Aert had obviously one of the, the favorites for the race. He had something like three or four, maybe even five punctures in a race. Absolutely insane. And then you see guys yeah, well, breaking wheels. La- last, year, uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken, didn't uh, Van Aert and Vanderpool, they were off the front together, just the two of them. And then Van Aert flatted and that was it. Vanderpool won. Yeah, so the you know Roubaix right now is kind of a lottery, and the riders know that they know it's a lottery because mm-hmm. there's a mm-hmm. high chance of getting a flat tire and your and your race is over. Not only uh, I I personally think that wider tires would be faster. I know some people are gonna disagree with that, but not only would they be faster uh, for for where it matters in the race, but you would actually be reducing your risk of puncturing. So it's exactly. kind of a win-win in in my yep. in my eyes. There's that there's that win was obviously you to first you know the first thing you've got to do is finish the race. There's that, and then there's it, it, there's a knock-on effect, isn't there? It's logistics of the team improves, the stress in the team car gets reduced. Mm-hmm. They don't need so many mechanics out on course. Uh, the risk of them not being a mechanic uh, with a wheel change in the right sector is reduced. Like everything, there's a knock-on effect to absolutely everything. Fatigue on the rider, less. Mental stress, less. Morale, probably better, like on rough ground. If you're feeling it after four hours and you've got another hour to go, are you really going to dig deep? Whereas if you were feeling super fresh because the bike's been gliding around all day, it's just everything like that you can't measure, but they are knock-on effects absolutely everywhere. But we'll see. Will they ever, will they ever listen to us? Will they ever watch the, uh, the Peak Talk podcast? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, like I said, my my prediction for you know you asked about uh, predictions for where road is going, or you alluded to mm. that. Um, my prediction for Roubaix is that whether they do it on road bikes or gravel bikes or whatever, tires are only going to continue to get wider every single year. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Tires will just get wider and wider and wider. And I guess the argument that I make is. Why do we have to keep making this incremental progress each year? I just want to get to the fastest tire size already. Uh, I just want to skip yeah, 10 agree. or 20 years into the future and just get to the mm. optimal tire size. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of anything else, particularly uh, you know, in engineering where you do these small incremental changes unless it was super risky or there were some safety critical components involved. Whereas normally what you do is you find one, end, one extreme, you go all the way to the other knowing that you've probably gone too far. So you overshoot 
mm -hmm. the, the, the kind of theoretical optimum, and then you start working backwards, and you do like an iteration down towards the middle. Whereas we just keep ticking up like two mil per, it's like a two millimeters every two years. It seems, seems like that. Yeah. Um, whereas I think well, you know, someone you, needs I'll to go out, the... do it on 40s, and then start working backwards. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think all it would take is, is one person to win the race on 40s or 45s, and then it would change forever. But I, I think the reason why the industry do, makes incremental progress as opposed to big leaps is because if they make too big a leap at once, no one will buy the bike. You know, If you sell a road bike with 45s, who wants that bike right now? No one. No. no. Um, but in 10 or 15 years, when Vanderpool wins Roubaix on a, a ro aero road bike with 45s, maybe a lot more people would buy that bike. So mm -hmm. it's fair to say that you science the shit out of everything when it comes to racing in your career, because that is your career. Um, where would you be in the pack without science? And are you jealous of the what I call the wattage boomers, uh, which is a term that... Whenever you go to a race and you're in the, I, mean, I don't race much anymore, but you know, when you, when I used to do crits or the odd mountain bike race, you know, you're having a chat to some guys in the car park or on the start line, you're sort of looking around, trying to think of something to say, like what else, what else do you say to these weirdos? You say, oh, you know, like what tires you're running, what pressure you're running. And, and they, the wattage boomers are those guys that just turn up, don't give a crap about the equipment. And they're just there with a massive grin on their face, just waiting to smash out watts per kilo. And they sort of look down at their bike and be like, Oh, I don't know. It's just you know, it's just what came on the bike. Do, do you in your <laughs> racing scene? Do you have guys like that, or are they all science based? I personally, I, I'm envious of those dudes who just turn up and just sit upright, bolt upright in the wind, and just churn watts. And they don't have that little demon in the back of their head going like, "Oh, get your head down," or "Did you wax your chain enough?" or "Is the tire pressure not yeah. optimal?" or like, "Is this he is this helmet not very aero?" They're just they're just loving life. Um, are, are the racers in your scene like that, or? I, I guess it's all relative because from my from my perspective and and viewers of my channel will know how nerdy I get about this stuff. From my perspective, I feel like there are a lot of racers and riders like that, even at the pro level, who don't pay very much attention to their equipment, and then they just have either a lot of natural talent or they work mm -hmm. really hard to get really strong, and they yeah they do they do well with. Uh, equipment that is suboptimal, in my opinion. Um, I, I, I think there's always going to be riders like that. Uh, I, I think that at this point, gravel racers are starting to pay more attention to their equipment. I, I think there's two directions we could take this question, because your question was, where would I be without science? Well, are we talking about equipment, or are we talking about training? Because I've applied it to both. You know, for the sake of my channel, uh, we, we sort of don't I don't think my viewers are that much into sports science, nutrition, and training. I might be wrong. Sorry if I was offended people out there. But let's just talk about the equipment first of all. So yeah. you're yeah. fair to say, you know, you're a you're a mid packer, aren't you? You're you're like page one of the results, but only if the result sheet is uh, you know, less than font size twelve. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so I the, last year they accepted thirty five men and 35 women into the Grand Prix, I finished 16th place. So I was I was okay. right mid-pack. Mm -hmm. um, slightly better, I guess, than mid-pack. Um, so yes, I, I am a, a mid-pack pro. Every single year, more people are wearing skin suits, more people are wearing aero socks, more people are wearing aero helmets. Uh, it's actually weird to see. It, I, I remember when people first started wearing aero helmets and you thought, oh, that... that thing looks weird it's a weird looking aero helmet and now it's almost mm. weird to not see somebody wearing an aero helmet uh same thing happens with gravel more people start to catch on so it actually gets harder to have an advantage with equipment every single year but i can actually put some numbers on your question with this example that i did with my last video which was on the drop bar mountain bike which i really geeked out over heavily in the preparation mm. for leadville because Leadville is one of these races where it is technically a mountain bike race. And I think that's just because historically the race has been raced on mountain bikes and the race started before a gravel bike even existed. However, I, I personally think that if the race was started in, in 2024 for the first time, they would call it a gravel race just because gravel is so hot right now and everyone mm -hmm. would show up on a gravel bike. <clears throat> and if you showed up on a mountain bike, you'd be the crazy one, right? Um, but the course is not very technical. 
it in fact there is there's a mile and a half of single track in 105 miles of racing wow so it's it's kind of uh i wouldn't call it a gravel race but it's sort of a jeep road race uh Mm -hmm. and i to me it seemed like drop bars were an obvious choice if you could make it down the downhills there's two downhills that i was worried about if you could make it down those fast enough you'd be fine and i tested it out and i was i was fine on those two downhills so i was like obviously i'm going with the drop bars i i calculated um what the difference would be between riding that bike and a normal flat bar mountain bike and i took out every section where i would be in the pack every section where i could do the puppy pause position because obviously if you're in the puppy pause position it doesn't matter if you have a road bar or a flat bar um and i i came away with the difference was six minutes over the course and six minutes would have been the difference between me getting the 17th place finish that i got and 21st place there's a lot there's a lot of people out there who would say 17th or 21st who cares like that does, you didn't win <laughs> yeah. you still didn't win the race so why does it matter right mm-hmm. why does it matter whether you got 17th or 21st i mean Sure, I like. I, I guess if you want to go down that rabbit hole, why does anything matter uh, at the end of the day? But if I this is this is part of the reason why I like this sport is these is trying to do as well in racing as I possibly can. Whether that has to do with training, nutrition, equipment, pacing. Okay, you can make this change to your bike, and it'll be the difference between you getting twenty first place and getting seventeenth place. It's a no brainer mm-hmm. for me. Obviously, I'm gonna do it. Uh, Mm -hmm. not everybody has that mindset, but, but that's, that's kind of one of the things that keeps me going with this sport. I I just love that aspect of the sport. Yeah. You mentioned not everyone has that mindset, but going back to the original question, roughly like how, what percentage of the field do you reckon does, is in it for the kind of optimization and the geeking out and how many people just turn up and churn, churn watts per kilo roughly? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, so I don't, I, I don't really see these as two separate categories. Like, there's people that are in it for optimization, and there's people in it that just, <laughs> just turn out watts. I, I yeah. kind of see it as a gray scale, right? So mm. uh, maybe on one side of the scale there's me, and then on the other side of the scale there's a guy that clearly he, like, he has an unwaxed chain, didn't think about aerodynamics whatsoever, wearing a baggy jersey, like, didn't shave his legs. Um, you know, has the slowest tires and doesn't care. Just got whatever tires they had at the bike shop. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I would say most at the pro level, I would say, like I said, every single year that people nudge closer and closer to where I'm at. Um, mm. And I think because the other thing, too, is it's just getting more competitive and the margins of victory are smaller and smaller and smaller. So when the margins of victory are smaller, and the it's getting more competitive and there's more money in the sport you're gonna Mm -hmm. see people doing more things to optimize it's hard it's hard to give a percentage because it's a grayscale but i I would say that over the past couple years i have seen a shift in professional gravel racing to where i would say the majority of my competition is at least thinking thinking about aerodynamics thinking about drivetrain efficiency thinking about tire rolling resistance we we can't really equate to that here because we don't have that level of gravel competition in this country although mm-hmm. i think it's coming uh, but if i was to looking at like the road racing scene at, at high high level road racing i think it's been like this for a long time is that everyone is optimized there is no yeah. there's no getting your way up the result sheet because you've got skin suit or aero socks or skinny bars like everyone not everyone is the thinker and a lot of them are the sheep, but when that public mm-hmm. that when that information by one or two thinkers is in the public domain, then everyone does it super quickly. There's no, there's no. It, it seems like there's no low hanging fruit anymore, um, and that's for the road scene and of course the time trial scene here, which is super nerdy, which is where a lot of these things get spawned yeah. from. But uh, I think the gravel events we do have in this country are <clears throat> a bit more fun. There are there are some seriously difficult like long distance. Uh, gravel events here but it's definitely less about optimization and more about having fun but um mm-hmm. are you uh, are you that's, how, that's how it discuss? used to be here in the u.s oh yeah i did i didn't want to get onto this spirit of gravel thing the rest of the world the rest of the world is where the u.s was with gravel uh 10 years ago 
10 years ago, no one was optimizing for, ever, for anything. They were just going out and having a good time on their gravel bikes, right? Uh, so I think that's where the rest of the world is right now. I mean, for me, I don't race on gravel, but I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to enter a few events, enter a few events this summer. Uh, but even when I'm not racing, like even if I'm training for road or gravel, I'll always like set the bike up in a way that I think is optimized for that terrain or that even just a slow mm -hmm. training ride. I want to be on a decent tire. Like I know if I go out on a slow tire on the road bike, if I'm doing zone two, it literally doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But I don't want to <laughs> ride a slow tire. Like I want to do my zone two and get far. Like I want to cover more kilometers in, in three or four hours. Mm -hmm. Um, are you at liberty to discuss your 2024 like race bike setup? Um, like in particular, what tires we're using? Because I think we're probably in agreement that frames uh, more or less converge to be pretty similar when it comes to gravel. Um, mm -hmm. the, obviously, the the average speeds of a race are slightly lower than than they are on road, so the pure aero of the frame isn't so important. And we're not seeing that much suspension in gravel bikes. Uh, I think dropper posts, depending on the course, is is like a really good tool. But obviously, depending on the course, if it's technical enough to, to need a, dro a dropper. So I think for a lot of people looking to go into gravel racing, the biggest area of optimization is tires. And it's so difficult because, yes, everyone's got different gravel, whether it be flint or sand or like single track. Like we, we have a lot of essentially gravel races in this country on mountain bike trails um mm -hmm. so you said you you know you've spent a lot of time researching tires and you've kind of gravitated towards wider tires can you discuss like what tires are the fastest so people can just straight up copy sure, <laughs> sure. yeah yeah so so first of all the equipment that i'm going to be on next year a lot of people have been asking me about that because i made a an announcement that i was leaving factor and I have not announced the new brand that I'm going to be on, partially because I don't actually have the bike in my hands yet to take a picture of. But that will be announced shortly. Not not here on this podcast, unfortunately. Oh, come on. I was going to come um, to that. Come on. <laughs> we can delay, we can delay the release of the podcast if you want. We can delay it a month. <laughs> And put Dan Biggins' uh, podcast. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if you want to delay. I don't know if you want to delay it that much because I don't know. I don't know when I'm going to get the bike built up. But what I will say, because <laughs> what you were talking about with the frame, I, I tend to agree. And I think, you know, when we went to the wind tunnel, um, I didn't include this in my video, but maybe I should have. We, uh, you know, we cut the lights out and we kind of used this. I, it was, um, I don't know what it was, a soap that was that was glow in the dark to try to see um, what sections of the bike were making a difference aerodynamically. And the down tube was making almost no difference. The down tube, mm. it, 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 it's like the, what, what made the biggest difference was the handlebars and the fork. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah on the gravel sure. bike. Yeah. Oh, it's so the same I on think any bike. that, <laughs> I mean on, on any bike, right. But particularly a yeah. gravel bike because the tires are so, wide and they're knobby it's just the the air moving around most of the frame is so you know so dirty that it just yeah. I, i'm not going to say it doesn't make any difference but it it mm -hmm. makes less of a difference than people think and i would say yeah, the two exactly. the, what you want to focus on if you're concerned about aerodynamics is your handlebars and your fork mm. um, uh, first first of all body position let's be honest well, like yeah, body yeah, body, CD, body CDA. Obvi yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. body position. And handlebars can yeah. help with that, right? Because there are handlebars. Yeah, sure. You can get narrow handlebars and, yeah. So, um, handlebars and fork, I actually think, are the most important in terms of aerodynamics, even it, especially for a gravel bike. Um, and then moving on to the next part of your question about tires, I, I have done tests where I, I test different sizes of the same tires and... Again, it depends on what kind of gravel you're testing on. There's there's obviously a lot of different types of gravel. There's gravel that's so smooth, it's basically pavement. And then there's gravel that's so chunky, it's basically mountain biking. But on, on gravel that I would say is in the middle between those two extremes, I, you, I'm, I continuously find that the widest tire is the fastest. And this is not me f feeling like it's the fastest because I know a lot of people, the way they test things is they just get on their bike and they feel whether something is fast or not. I usually what I do is I have a set course and I ride it at the same power output and time it and I'll do and I'll do multiple laps. And 
wider tires are usually faster and the other conclusion that i've come to is that lightweight mountain bike tires like we're talking about a schwalbe thunderbird or a conti race king something like that are actually faster than almost every gravel tire and i think that part of the reason for that is because it is a it is a higher volume and i think that's helpful but also i think these tires get away with using a thinner casing and not always but generally a thinner casing means a faster tire too and they can get away with a thinner casing because the volume of the tire is so much higher, so you're not actually increasing the puncture risk. And yeah, for me, mountain bike tires are, are the fastest, whether it's the Conti Race King, um, which is basically like Tom Peacock's tire, isn't it? That's what the, the, the best XC is sure. in the world use that. Um, and for me, another benefit, I think the, the high-end like XC tires, because XC is a little bit kind of niche and dying, they tend to be a bit cheaper than the, the high-end, really boutique gravel tires as well. So it's a bit of a win-win. Um, but yeah, I certainly. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm, maybe it's just because I'm I'm much bigger and I don't need to worry about the aero of the bike so much. And I would normally choose a wider tire anyway. For my gravel bike and what I do on it, I, 50 mil is my minimum. Like I wouldn't choose anything smaller than that, which is essentially a 2.0. Basically, exactly a 2.0 mountain bike tire. The the use case for a very skinny gravel tire is is almost not there unless you're on pretty much road a lot and you need to worry about the aero. Mm -hmm. But in your testing, what, what, what type of average speeds are we talking for these super wide tires to still be faster? So the, the segment that I use has a slight, uh, I, I do, I'll, I'll do the segment out and then I'll do the segment back and I, I repeat multiple times out and back. So I've got a data point from out and a data point from back. Mm -hmm. And out is slightly uphill and back is slightly downhill. So when I'm coming slightly downhill, I even though I'm not putting out uh, the power that I would put out in a race, it is the mm. speed that I would be averaging in a race. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I'm, again, I'm generally finding that, uh, and, and this is something that I want to work with Silka on, um, I think we have plans of doing wind tunnel testing again this year and also doing rolling resistance testing. But I, I, what I kind of want to work out is at what point does the, the increase width of the tire, is it such a big arrow penalty that that's the point at which you need to stop, right? I, I want to I find what the stopping point in width is because <laughs> right. right now I think that the, the industry just has gravel tire size wrong. Everybody else on gravel tires that are too narrow but my yeah. question is, you know, I don't want to make, like we said with Roubaix, I don't want to make incremental improvements. I just want to find what the fastest tire size is right now mm -hmm. and be running that yeah. right now. Go to the extreme and then work backwards. But I think the the issue is sure. on this on this subject, as as we go much above like a 2.2 .2 or 2.25, we're into the realm of like a different type of tire where it's a like a heavy trail or a even an enduro tire, and then obviously it's, start, it's going to be start to be slower because of the, the really thick sidewalls or the tread pattern. So maybe yeah. you're actually asking for a scenario that doesn't exist. Like maybe your fastest gravel tire is something like a Race King, you know, a thin mm -hmm. sidewall, lightweight XC tire, but in a much bigger width, and it just doesn't exist. So maybe, <laughs> maybe, yeah, I, maybe you're not going to find that. I point, keep... You know? I want to see Continental come out with different sizes of the Race King. The the Race King that is the fast tread pattern, the black chili compound, um, or the fast compound, the only comes in a 2.2. I want it in a 2.0 for gravel racing, and I want it in a 2.4 for mountain bike racing. And if they kept the 2.2, that would be great too. But they need more sizes. I don't think enough people have caught on to the fact that the compound of the tire is what makes a fast tire. Uh, at least in gravel racing, most people, when they're trying to decide what, gra what tire gravel tire is fast or slow, they're looking at the tread pattern. And the tread pattern mm -hmm. does make a difference, but I would argue that what makes more of a difference than the tread pattern is the compound of the tire. Yeah. I'm at fault here because I mentioned about the cost of tires, but actually, but my point is the performance gain from a fast tire is is cheap versus mm -hmm. what, what people think are, are going to make them go fast, which is a fancy frame. Actually, mm -hmm. the frame really yeah. doesn't matter as long as it puts your body in the right position. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Spend your money on the tires, even if you have to buy, you know, many, just spend the I, money on the tires, which brings me on to like in a race, what, what do you do if you get a puncture in a race? you know, one that doesn't seal with the sealant, 
is that race over for you, or can have you got a very quick like strategy, or and you've you've trained your kind of puncture repair, you know, put a put a dart in it and carry on? Is what, what's your, how do you how do you deal with a puncture in a race? You know, it's funny. I don't recommend this to people, but this is what I do. I I don't carry a tube with me, mm-hmm. and that's what I don't mm-hmm. recommend to people. People should be carrying a tube because. You know, you you want to you want to make it out of of whatever situation you're in. Some of these races are in the middle of nowhere, and if your bike stops working, you could actually be in trouble. Um, <laughs> but the reason the reason I don't carry a tube is because almost always in a gravel race, if you have to put a tube in, you're gonna get another flat. It's just inevitable yeah. that you're gonna puncture yeah. puncture the tube. Yeah. Uh, I carry a Dyna plug with me, and I think Dyna plug makes the best plug on the market. I've used a bunch of different plugs, and I think I think Dyna plug works the best in my personal opinion. And I carry CO twos, and the amount of CO twos that I carry depends on how big the puncture risk is. So, for example, for mm-hmm. Unbound, I might carry three CO twos, but for something that's I don't know, like Steamboat Gravel, I might only carry one. By the way, having a flat tire in a gravel race when you have that setup is probably a 30 to 45 second mechanical. It's not that big a deal. You you hear your tire, you stop immediately, you get that plug out. Hopefully it's in a spot that you can get to really quickly, which is something I recommend for gravel racers. The plug should mm. be, mm. you should be able to get to your plug in five seconds. And then you wow. plug the tire, hit it with the CO2, and you're off on your way. And if mm. you're good at it, it's 30 or 45 seconds, and you probably have to chase for five minutes to get back to the group. But other than that, your race is not over by any means. I think I think that could be a bit of a, a win for a lot of people that maybe come from a XC or cyclocross background, is that if you, if you get a flat, essentially you get into that mental state where you think, okay, my race is over, I'm, I've got no rush to fix mm-hmm. this because I'm going to be lost. But actually, if you have a very well-drilled routine that you've practiced and you can keep it under a minute you're not doing too bad like i think that's a massive gain that people don't appreciate enough Mm -hmm. so how long like a lifetime grand prix race how in terms of hours what we're talking like how long is the race or are the races on average they yeah they vary a lot the shortest race is schwamigan which is a mountain bike race on grass and that one is about two hours long and the longest one is unbound and winning times from that have been around 10 hours yeah nine or ten hours at this point yeah. It's a there's a huge variation in in race length. I mean, Schwamigan is mm-hmm. kind of an XC mountain bike race style effort, and then obviously Unbound mm-hmm. is is completely different than that. Can drop in by a couple of minutes just on the puncture repairs mm-hmm. if you've you know well drilled it. So that's a good point. Yeah. T- so to that point that you were just making, I want to make this point about the last race, which is Big Sugar. Uh, Big Sugar in the Lifetime Grand Prix is the final race, and it is notorious for flats. It's just the gravel there is really sharp and flat Mm -hmm. tires are really common. And the rider that got first and the rider that got second and the rider that got third, so the podium, all Mm -hmm. the top three riders all got flat tires during the race. Right. And they still managed to finish one, two, three. I guess that kind of goes to show you in these races, a flat tire is not a race ending mechanical by any means. I think it's something I definitely need to work on because if I'm out on my gravel bike, if I'm getting a flat tire, I'm thinking about starting to head back <laughs> because I don't trust my repairs. Uh, whether my plugs are not very good, my, my sealant tends to be okay, but I don't know. Have you got any like tips and tricks on, on like what sealant to use or any, any special cocktails you're putting in the sealant? Because from my point of view, if the puncture's big enough to hear it, and this goes for mountain biking as well, like my enduro bike and my downhill bike. If the puncture is big enough to actually hear it whilst you're riding, then it ain't sealing. Um, and I've tried all yeah. types of sealant. I uh, just I am sponsored by this company, but I do genuinely think that this is the most puncture resistant sealant on the market. Uh, mm. Silka. I don't want to say it's a perfect product because there are trade offs with having sealant that works so well. Uh, Silka yeah. sealant works really well, and it's got carbon fibers in the sealant to help seal. And but the trade-off with it working so well and so you said it's got carbon fibers in the sealant. That, yeah, that sounds like snake oil. <laughs> why do well, you, it does, why it, do you need carbon fiber in a, in a tire? Why don't you just use have, cotton? Have you ever have you ever heard of people putting glitter in tires to try to help yeah, with yeah, the yeah. help yeah, with the sealant? I've heard yeah. of that. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 that. It's that same idea. I think the reason why they went with carbon fibers is because they're very fine and they're very small. Mm. Mm. 
mm-hmm. um, because if if you use glitter, uh, it's kind of a crapshoot whether the glitter is actually going to hit the hole or not because it's a it's kind of big. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was a piss take. I'm using a, a basically a, an off road vehicle sealant in all my tires. I mean, if I was sponsored, oh, okay. I might not be using such a cheap sealant, but the the amount of tires that I swap out like on down a bike, enduro bike, hardtail, and now gravel bike, I I just need lots of the stuff. But actually, I found it to be really good. It's uh, I'm not sure if you can get it in the states. It's um, I think it's a Spanish company, but it's basically for like off road vehicles, mining trucks, and stuff. The silica sealant, the silica sealant will clog your valves and it will dry out quickly. Um, but they actually mm. make a replenisher that doesn't have any carbon fibers in it, so it doesn't dry yeah. out or clog your valves as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't use any of the replenisher when I'm racing because I just want the sealant to work as well as possible. And this is what I tell people. There's a trade-off for having sealant that works so well. The trade-off is that it dries out quickly, it gunks up your tire, it clogs your valves. But the tr- for all of that extra headache, which for some people is too much headache, I will admit, but mm. for a racer, the the trade-off with all that headache is that you have a sealant that works extremely well during the season how often are you pulling the bead off the tires on your race bike to you know just check the amount of wet sealant in there every i'm almost doing every single race on a new pair of tires which i i'm that's that's just me there are some people that i've talked to that did the whole season on one pair of tires they're those people that you were talking about earlier who just show up on the equipment that they have and smash it yeah. smash the watts out i'm not that person i'm i'm doing almost every single race on a new pair of, new pair of tires or at least a fairly new pair of tires um yeah because having a newer pair of tires also reduces the risk of getting a puncture and obviously you put a new pair of tires on you got fresh sealing in there <laughs> i don't i don't want a tire sponsor Unless it's the fastest. Why. <laughs> well so but here's the thing there are so many tire companies that Get, get it right with the gravel tire and then get it wrong mm. with the mountain bike tire or vice versa. They get it right with the mountain bike tire and get it wrong with the gravel tire. Uh, I don't know if a... Con- I don't know. Conti is pretty good because the Terra yeah. Speed is pretty good and the Race King is pretty good. But I don't know of a single company that, that I would... I would actually buy both of their tires for, mm. you know, for the use case and use yeah. that... Even Conti, I mean, I've used the Terra Speed, and I thought it was a decent tire, but I wouldn't use the Terra Speed for a lot of gravel racing. I think it's too narrow, uh, and some gravel races, I think the puncture risk is too high. So oh, right. the reason okay. I don't want the reason why I don't want a tire sponsor is because I think it's one of the most important components on the bike for gravel racing, mm-hmm. and I don't want yeah. to I don't want to compromise on that component. I would rather spend my own money and run the tires that I want to run. I'm actually riding like Conti on every discipline of my bike. So if Conti want to sponsor the channel, mm. uh, come along. You know, I've plugged <laughs> you enough on this channel. I, <laughs> I've plugged them enough on the mm. channel. But yeah, I, yeah. I, it just tends to be my go-to. But I'm not mm. riding gravel tires. I'm riding X, uh, XC tires on my gravel bike. I wanted to hear more about is the, your, the classified hubs. I was, mm-hmm. I was skeptical about classified hubs because I, as a marginal gains nerd, I want my drivetrain to be as efficient as possible. And I was yeah. just thinking, okay, I mean, if there's if there's any sort of efficiency loss, I don't want I, I don't want to hear about it. I'm not interested. And then I watched your videos on the classified hubs, and I was actually quite impressed by how how good they got the efficiency on those. I must admit, I was very skeptical as well. Um, and going mm-hmm. back a year, year and a half ago, when I first looked at the system and looked at the patent drawings. I was I was a non-believer. I was I've designed planetary gearboxes myself in in my job, like robotics engineering, and um, to get a system with efficiency like above ninety eight percent is really difficult. Um, but to get it in an application like for a bike, which is not hermetic, it's not in a clean environment. I, I thought it was impossible. I must admit. So when I did the testing, I well I actually met the guys uh, classified at uh, Eurobike earlier this year, uh, earlier last year, and basically tried to blag a, blag a wheel set off them. They, they were very concerned that I was going to, you know, take it apart and show everyone the internals. But hey, look, anyone can go and buy one and do that themselves. So I don't know why they were worried about that too much. But it's really hard to test these things in, a, in, a, in an outdoor environment. But that is the acid test because 
yeah, you can test it on a like a back-to-back -to -back torque rig in a lab, but then you can't ap apply radial loads like rider weight and any bump inputs on those rigs. So even when they've tested their their hub efficiency against the DT Swiss 240 or something, it's only in a like it's basically weightless. There's no rider weight going down on all those hub bearings. Uh, the 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 main shaft of the the hub, which is similar like a 15 mil axle, it's similar to a you know the main hub axle of a DT240. There's no bending on that. There's no bearing misalignment. So it's a very perfect case scenario. So in my head, when I did the outdoor testing, I was thinking. Uh, yeah, wait till I put my fat 90 kilogram ass on it and start doing stuff to the axle. And then you've got like sinusoidal loading of the pedal is different to like a motor applying the torque in the test rig. But from what I could tell, I mean, yes, there is lots of error present in doing outdoor measurements, whether it's, you know, distance variation as you, as you go up a climb, unless, you're, unless it's a dead straight climb. Are you mm -hmm. slightly going longer on one repeat or, you know, it could be a couple of meters different here and there, which could be, you know, tenths of a percent on the time. Um, you've got the power, ma power meter accuracy, which isn't so important. It's more about the re re repeatability is, is the issue with the power meters, which is obviously why you do repeats. But even with the repeats, uh, there was like pretty good consistency to say that the efficiency was right up there. It was like 90 98.7% efficient mm -hmm. with the, the caveat is that efficiency figure of 98.7, which I got is based on the theoretical efficiency of the hub in its locked state. So when the hub is in a one to one gear ratio, it's essentially just working as a normal rear hub. It's four bearings on the shaft basically. So that efficiency reduction of when you're using the, the lower gear ratio is based on a theoretical efficiency from their lab test. So what the actual efficiency is, no one knows, but you can't test that. You can't test two hubs back to back on the same, on the same bike at once. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, after that, I was, I, was, I was really, really impressed. There is a tangible weight increase from the setup I went to. So I was taking off like a Dura Ace front mech and quite high end parts. So I think I put about 150 grams onto the bike with the classified system, even though I lost the chain ring. It's, it's, I was talking about this to a, to a colleague recently. It's such a shame that the bike industry is so hung up on weight because it really doesn't matter. Like that 150 grams, mm -hmm. if you work out like the extra energy on a climb is, is almost nothing. Um, we should be worried about efficiencies. So any inefficiency or whether it be drivetrain or CRR rolling resistance is basically like adding a gradient to, it's like adding percent to a gradient of your climb. It's a direct yeah. like linear thing essentially it's like a virtual front mech i now i'm using the system on my gravel bike i'm changing gear way more often like just banging in between those two big ratio jumps okay there's a massive jump but if you're if you're speeding down a, a hill and you're coming into a gradual like kicker which gets really steep and really slow at the top instead of like fiddling around the rear gears because it's so smooth i'll just press the button uh and there's no like there's no worry about chain drop or you know, coaxing the front mech, it's like, it's instant. Maybe for the same gear at the back, now with the two ratios, you don't need to be cross-chaining so much. So there's a, a, a big efficiency gain from not cross-chaining. Okay, at the extreme ends of the cassette, you're still gonna get cross-chaining. There's nothing you can do about it. It's one by. No, I think it's uh, I think it's a good system. I've, I've got a slight doubt about the longevity. So basically, in another couple of months, I'm gonna do the same efficiency test outdoors again, uh, just because I've put it through like, six months of basically rain constant rain and salt on the road yeah i'd need to do a like a, a long-term efficiency test to see if it's there's any decline in the efficiency yeah unless you're racing up our hour and a half long climbs in the alps i think it's a good system it's just a shame i think it's so hard to commercialize i don't think the big group set makers will take it on i don't think frame builders will try and integrate it that's what that's what i wanted to ask you is is do you see this actually taking off in performance cycling like do you do you see uh, t teams adopting this do you see uh individuals who are interested in performance picking this over having uh you know two chain rings in the front with a with a mech i think in road racing i don't think it's going to take off because of the logistics of wheel wheel changes 
it's it's going to be one of those things where everyone's on it or that or no one's on it. You know, like when disc brakes came in, it was it was even even sure. you know just one forty or one sixty disc brakes on the team car or on the neutral service car was enough of a headache. You know, the through axle size or whatever. Like this is a is is another level compared to that because you've got to have this weird torque reaction lever which reacts the torque you're pedaling that has to brace up against mm-hmm. the frame and. That is specific to every different frame. You have to look up this little lookup table and get the right length one and the right height of washers and all this stuff. So that really needs like a frame frame redesign or built into the frames in the in the initial stage. So if you instead of the dropout, you know, just dropping the wheel into the dropout, mm-hmm. the dropout to get around this issue, the dropout recess in all the bikes would have to be a square, so it could re- like react that torque or a spline or something. So. I think there are a couple of Ridleys knocking about with custom dropouts for this this system. But I don't think it's going to take off in in pro racing because I think Shimano and SRAM are just so big they're just going to ignore it. I don't think yeah. they particularly want to buy it. So it's I think it's still going to be like a privateer thing. Um there are I know a couple of pro riders out there with these systems on their TT bikes. Um Mm-hmm. So they can train on TT bikes long long rides and they can train in the mountains on TT bikes. Um, mm-hmm. and have the added gear ratio of a, of a front mech where the aerodynamics for those guys racing at 55 k's an hour is, is pretty bad to have a front mech and another chain ring. So there are these small niches where the system really works. I think for gravel, like like epic gravel events or Marathon XC, I think it's amazing because mm-hmm. I think Marathon XC, although we might think it's a bit of a dying niche, those kind of rides where you've got long hours in the saddle, long climbs, you don't really want to be in a one by scenario with a 50 tooth cog on the back because it's so inefficient. Like yep. if it's just your local, if you're a local dude at the woods, you know, on a pedaling up, pedaling up his enduro bike and then he's going to have a beer like uh, afterwards. It doesn't matter if you're cross chain mm-hmm. from a 30 tooth to a 50 tooth. Like it sounds awful, but yep. no one's worrying about the efficiency. But when you've got these niche races, like big kind of multi-day XC races or gravel races, where you do need to worry about the efficiency, I think it is, it's, it's a pretty good system to have. I mean, just as an example, uh, the race that I was talking about, Leadville, I, I think that there is a, all mountain bikes are won by at this point, pretty much, but I mm. actually think that is one race where there is a good argument to be made for for going back to two by for that race. Mm-hmm. And it's mm. for that reason. Uh, for example, going up Columbine, which is the climb that goes to the halfway point, you're climbing for over an hour, or depending on how fast you are, an hour, and you are you are close to, you are either in the 50 tooth or close to the 50 tooth for most of that climb, right? So you're spending a lot of time in your mm-hmm. least efficient gear ratio. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's why I've made the argument that a two by might actually be a better, uh, a better call for Leadville, but it could be possible that using something like this might be a better solution too. <laughs> Obviously, everything comes down to testing, but I personally, I've, I've not actually done an efficiency test on like a 50 tooth rear cassette or a 51 tooth rear cassette. But mm-hmm. just from looking at it and the sound it makes when you're on a on a dirty drivetrain as well, which a lot of you know you're going to have by the time you get mm-hmm. to these these climbs, it's sandy or it's dry. The, the lubes come off. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, so yeah, two by or a classified hub could really be a, a, a big winner. And you know, I, I recently rode a hardtail that had two like an XC hardtail with two by on it. And I haven't ridden two by on a mountain bike for, for years. And it was so good. It was just like why why are we why doing this stupid one by thing when most of the gears are terrible and noisy? And like mm-hmm. you, you go on a two you go on a two by bike again and it you know, the chain is straighter, the front mech works amazingly. The only downside is that with a smaller chain ring up front you've got higher chain tension, which is another mm-hmm. source of chain, uh, you know, drivetrain friction. But if, if the chain line can offset that loss, then yeah, I, if I was to go and buy an XC mountain bike tomorrow, I'd probably have it with two by again. You've played around a bit with aero sensors. I have an aero sensor myself, but I will admit that I have not used it a lot and I have not mm. done any meaningful testing with it. Uh, I think that right now they're, they're, you have to man you have to be such a nerd to even get any sort of usable data out of an aero sensor i think anybody who's watched your videos using an aero sensor can attest to that um 
I, I'm wondering if, if you think that there will come a point where the data that you're getting from an aero sensor is so user friendly that it could actually start being a product like a power meter where it, almost every performance oriented road cyclist is using it. You're right. You do have to really want to go and do some testing one day. Uh, it's almost a whole day mm -hmm. gone to test maybe two or three wheel sets back to back just because of yeah. the level of preparation, uh, checking and the, the weather conditions have to remain pretty constant uh your tire you need a calibrated tire pressure sensor because the error sensor doesn't know what crr you've got so you're essentially fixing the crr but to a kind of guest value um, so you need to make sure that that crr throughout the whole day of testing is the same whether it's you know, you start the testing and it might be 10 degrees C in the morning and then in the afternoon it's 20, that's going to throw the results. Like the, it, the stars have to align to get a good day of testing. When they work, they work really well. And you can mm -hmm. get some really valuable data at, at finer resolution than you can get with the Chung method or doing timed segments or anything like this. Uh, because, you know, time Strava segments, unless the segment is like an hour long, they're a waste of time. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I do like using it. However, I've like you not used it so much because the t I, I feel for myself the time invested is not worth what i'm gaining from it because i'm yeah. not at that yeah i'm not at the com competition level where i need to do it now if i was a coach and i was coaching juniors or guys who really wanted to go fast at tting i'd get back into it but if if, if i'm not monetizing my time with this sensor i'm not using it because it's it just takes too long so you have to do, I think the one I'm using, I've got pretty much every test is at least 10K. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just out and back, same course. If, if, if at some point that course changes, like the CRR changes, you can't compare. Like if, if, if the local council was to go and resurface that road tomorrow, I wouldn't be able to compare anything that I'd done on it before until ne like again. Right. I'd have to start all of the library of tests and all the data again. So... <laughs> Uh, it's it's amazing technology because it, it leverages so many sensors, um, mm -hmm. GPS, wheel speed, barometer, power sensor, like it, it gets all these high end bits of tech talking to each other to give you a CDA. But the problem is for these guys making these amazing products, you just can't commercialize it. So they don't, we don't see them because they're not, I mean, I would consider myself or you and me were pretty nerdy when it comes to these things, but even I draw the line at going to waste a whole weekend to do some error testing on some wheels. Like there are a couple of other companies that I've been talking to this year. So maybe I will have a new, I mean, I'm, I'm talking of more of a legacy kind of point of view, but I am sure. hopefully going to get my hands on a couple more sensors this year from other companies um, that have, you know, emailed me and hold my hands up. I've been a bit tardy on, on replying um, because I don't really fancy error testing in the pissing rain. Um, but maybe when spring summer comes around, I'll get back into it. But yeah, I think one of them is, is promising a live CDA reading, which would be really, really cool. That I think is, that's the level we need to get to, but doing that reliably yeah. is super difficult. So I, I don't, I, I'll be honest. I actually don't know how much I can talk about this product. So I won't, I won't name the product by name. Uh, but I, the one, the one that I have, it's not on your head unit, but it is on your phone and you can quad lock your phone to your handlebars and you can actually get live CDA while you're riding. And okay. it's, um, it, I, I think that what they are trying to do with it is, is as the tech, what they foresee is that, you know, 10 years down the line, if the technology has gotten good enough, this could be something that, you know, it goes to the head unit and it is, it is a standard piece of equipment on road bikes, just like power meters are. And you can actually, if you have live CDA right there in front of you, um, you can have your, your, you can have your power output, you can have your CDA, and then you can have your Watts per CDA. And you can actually, you can actually do something about your aerodynamics in real time. You know, you can get your position even lower, or you can get your, your shoulders in more, or you can get your elbows in more, and you can actually train aerodynamics while you're, while you're riding or while you're racing. Uh, which I think is is interesting. I actually think that that is perhaps a more uh, is 
that's probably more useful for people than using it to test a pair of wheels um, is actually looking at your CDA in real time and trying to do something about your CDA with your body in real time. Mm -hmm. And you can see the CDA change on the screen in real time as well. It's kind of a, it's kind of a reminder. Uh, oh yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not getting as aerodynamic as I possibly can, because if you look at people while they're racing, um, that aerodynamic position for most people isn't very comfortable and mm. they're not holding that aerodynamic position for nearly as long as they should. And having it on mm. your screen is just that reminder to say, hey, get back in the aero position. We don't need to overcomplicate this if this is going to become commercialized product. I think all it needs to be is, is even if the number was a bit like drifty and not very accurate, it's just that reminder. So, you know, if you've got a, mm -hmm. if you've got a 20 hour week training program lined up you might think yeah i've hit all my numbers this week i've you know i've gone out and done a couple of really really long rides i've done my intervals how many hours have you actually spent in your race aero tuck none and then you come to your race first five minutes and your triceps are like killing you because they're so fatigued because you've not practiced any of it so i think sometimes to put like there should, maybe there could be a level of the sensor or the data where you could do, you could do some of your post like analysis and get really deep into the kind of like the lap CDAs if you did want to separate separate it. But I think for most people they need is just a reminder. Um, yeah. Just so just so when you're out there doing like a four hour ride, you 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 spend you know a couple of blocks of ten twenty minutes really 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 like tucked down and trying to train your body on that. Because I, I I mean I'm guilty of that you know doing long long training rides and then yeah the last thing I want to do is sit in a aero position. So I just don't do it. And then you come to a sort of road road TT or something and you, you just, it's hell because your legs feel great. Your lungs feel great. But yeah, your triceps or your shoulders are burning because you haven't practiced that position. So um, yeah. maybe, yeah, maybe Absolutely. we don't need to do a sensor. Maybe just a piece of duct tape on the stem that says, get small, you fat bastard <laughs> or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Can't tell us your bite sponsor. We can put, we can put a nice picture on the screen. We can download it. Well, I'm pretty good at uh, Microsoft. I'm pretty good at paint. Um, so yeah, I um, yeah, I don't know if I should say my bike sponsor. I Come mean, on, I, I would hope I don't. It could make my channel blow when, up when you're. I know, right? I I don't know when yeah. you're planning on putting this out. Uh, I'm hopefully getting the bike within the next week or so, and the the picture should be up on Instagram then. So. Um, any any features that might have a little clue there? Followers of mine will know, and uh, probably anyone who just listened to this podcast because we talked about tires so much. Um, yeah. I am obviously a fan of wider tires, and I would not accept a sponsorship from a bike company that has a max tire mm. clearance of 40 or 45 millimeters anymore. So yeah. the max tire clearance on this bike is 50 millimeters. And that was that was uh, that was a selling point for me because I I want to experiment with doing wider tires on gravel bikes now. I I've got I've got a uh, an idea of who it could be, but I'm not gonna. We were talking about this before we started recording. I I don't mm. know how much crossover there is with our two audiences because I talk mostly about coaching or I'm doing or, or training related topics or I'm doing a race report. And then yours is yours is engineering and tech oriented. So there may be a lot of crossover there. Maybe people in the in the comments can tell us whether or not they watch both of our channels or only one of our channels. Um, but yeah, yeah. Let's know. Let us know down below. Uh, who did you find first? Was it Dylan or myself? And I, I definitely think since you've been racing more and doing less kind of sports science white paper discussions i think maybe there has been more mm -hmm. of a crossover because of the the drop bar bike and the the nerding out on tires and stuff i, th I definitely think they're sort of merged a little bit lately but uh, yeah let us know down below i have quite uh, animated commenters and trolls in my um <laughs> in in my demographic they're very needy uh, opinionated some say like they're master <laughs> but uh <laughs> yeah we'll see we'll see what happens <laughs> but yeah anyway thanks for joining and uh we'll hope you get you on again sometime soon yeah thanks for having me on cheers